My name is Nikki Williams. Um, welcome this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we really appreci appreciate you coming here uh, so that we can share with you BFI Replay and behind the scenes and how we created BFI Replay. I am delivery manager for Heritage 22, so uh, that means that I manage special programs um, at the BFI National Archive. Um, and this particular program, Heritage 22, is a lottery funded program. It was a five year program um, and it comes to end this December uh, 23. Our, our mission was to preserve one of our missions. It was a seven-stranded complex program, which we're, um, I won't go into today because today we're, we're concentrating on replay and videotape digitization. But one of our um, primary missions was to preserve up to 100,000 uh, at-risk, significant UK um, videotapes, um, 100,000 titles, um, and to make some of those works available to audiences. Um, BFI Replay came somewhat into the process. Um, the uh, program Heritage 22 was actually meant to finish in 2022, but we had a small thing called COVID, which got in the way of finishing the program by then. So it was extended for another two years to, to this year. Um, we, uh, in that process, it became clear that uh, preservation was our priority and uh, Dylan will uh, cave our curatorial expert will will talk a little bit about the selection process in a moment to you but it became um, uh, it bec we became aware and with our conversation with DCMS that we also wanted to make some of this work accessible to audiences um, so there's many complexities in that which we'll, we'll go into um, but BFI replay which started off as a library product when I came into post two years ago um, was one of the access points for Heritage 22 and those at-risk videotapes. Um, so BFI Replay came into being. Um, specifically, the DCMS and Lottery asked us to focus on libraries as a place for this to sit, um, as one of our last sort of open democratic public spaces, public realms, um, and also in terms of digital poverty, given access to uh, UK-wide audiences to screen heritage, your screen heritage. So that's how BFI Replay came about. Um, so, but we couldn't have done it on our own. Um, we are the BFI National Archive, um, the leading body for uh, screen heritage. But uh, the RNAs, the Regions and Nations Archives, were involved in this program and very much part of it. Um, so that's our, our, re our regional um, archive partners. Um, and um, we digitise their work from up and down the country. And Andy Wright, our videotape digitisation manager, we'll talk a little bit about that. There's Andy there. Um, but around, um, Andy will go into the figures, but around 50,000 works came from the BFI National Archive collections, and over 50,000 came from uh, our Regions and Nations Archive film partners. And that was no small undertaking that, that, that we did to move that uh, between us, to move that, those videotapes around the country. Um, there's a whole plethora of suppliers involved in that um, because of the range of videotape formats that's involved that Andy will go into, um, but also the logistics of moving that stuff in and out of vaults and across the world because we also had suppliers in other countries as well. So this is what BFI Replay looked like in its first iteration. Um, and Mark Dugoid is going to talk a little bit about the uh, curation and the creation of the actual platform. Um, but it is now available in libraries across the UK um, and we keep rolling out every day. Um, so how did we get there? How did we start and where did it all come from? I'd like to introduce Dylan Cave, who's going to come up. Um, and Dylan was the lead um, on Heritage 22 Selections. Give Dylan a round of applause. <laughs> and led the audit, so I'll let him take over. Do you want uh, yeah, so my name's Dylan Cave. I'm the Collections development manager. I'm part of the curatorial team uh, within the BFI National Archive uh, and what uh, me and my team do uh, are think about the ways in which we can bring materials into the national collection, uh, think about collections appraisal uh, and we also do uh, a little bit of kind of uh, deaccessioning activity in the rare cases uh, that that's uh, ever needed. My team were very much involved in the um, kind of selection uh, of materials and that's basically what I'm going to kind of talk through uh, today. 
Nikki's already said uh, that the uh, Heritage 2022 programme had uh, multi strands. Uh, there was kind of different uh, aspects of it, and you, you can see uh, some of the different strands there. Uh, but obviously, one of the key parts of it was uh, the videotape uh, digitization. And I should just say a word about um, how this kind of strand uh, developed, basically. Um, I think. Uh, thinking about um, where we are in terms of the international archive community, uh, understanding uh, kind of how we approach different types of formats uh, that the kind of moving images held on. Uh, with film, you know, we've understood for a while that if you uh, reduce the temperature uh, of the storage conditions around film uh, and the humidity, actually bring them to below freezing point, um, we know that there's a conservation plan around uh, film. Uh, there are projected um, material in no storage conditions. Um, the, the projections are that materials will last decades, perhaps even centuries, in those conditions without deteriorating. Digital, very different model. It's all about making sure your, your ones and zeros are, are, are bit perfect, and then it's uh, a strategy to kind of keep them alive, keep them migrated. Uh, that's, that's basically how you uh, adapt them. And, and keep them preserved and conserved. With videotape, it's kind of s caught somewhere between the middle. And one thing, as we um, approach this project, and we need to be very grateful to people like Charles Farrell, who was our uh, head of uh, conservation, still very much involved in the Heritage 2022 program, uh, made it very clear that um, videotape um, has some of the issues that you might find with film. You know, it can. Um, after in, in bad storage conditions, be subject to um, uh, deteriorating conditions. You know, the, the videotape can snap. Uh, it can be subject to things like mold, etc., uh, etc. Et so there are risks there in terms of the, the long-term life of actual video tapes. And I should say here, we're talking about videotapes and actual video as it exists on open reel as well. But there's also other aspects that are at, at risk. Uh, with film, you can hold it up to a piece of light and you can kind of see what the images are. With videotape, you're completely dependent on machinery to retrieve the images and to actually get back uh, something that relates to that moving image. And of course, that machinery is aging as well. So there's another inherent risk around that too. And of course, the skills that goes around operating that machinery is a very key thing as well. So it was very much a, a, a live issue. We understood the risks there. We understood that we had the funding to kind of preserve 100,000 uh, in total. Uh, and the issue that the collective team, but particularly my, my, my team, were, were faced with, if you imagine this is a, a photo of our uh, Vault 2 at our conservation center in, um, in, in, in Berkhamstead, um, you can see there a run of um, videotapes. If you imagine there are, I think, 24 bays um, of, uh, like that in that particular vault. And just to add to it, uh, particularly where you can see the videotapes near the front of that photograph, they are actually double stacked. So you can see the scale uh, of the actual videotapes uh, that we hold. And of course, we were posed with a, a really significant question, which is if you want to digitize 100,000 items, where do you begin? Do you begin in the top left-hand corner and just work along if you do that? What are you potentially missing? So we need to come up with a schema in which to kind of do a sensible kind of uh, way of surfacing to the top the materials that we felt met some criteria. And I'll run through them now. So basically, there had to be an understanding of videotapes that were kind of at risk. Um, some are more at risk than others. I think, Nikki, we were talking about there being potentially, you know, up to kind of 70, I think, different formats uh, of videotapes. Some of them took off and some of them were, were very kind of popular. If you think of something like Digibeta, which became an industry standard, there's lots of knowledge around that and there's a, a, a big volume of them. Some of the other formats uh, are very kind of bespoke and they require uh, a particular expertise to extract images from. They, they may have surfaced up as more uh, at risk. There are some videotapes that actually were susceptible to different types of deterioration more than others. Umatic proved to be very challenging there. So there was the physical at risk issue. But we are driven curatorially, and it's really 
important to emphasize that we're never ever just talking about objects. We're always talking about the content on them. And so one of the things that, we, that was really important for us was thinking about the cultural significance of the material uh, on the tape. Alongside that, um, as you know, our target was 50,000 uh, items. It was 100,000 altogether, but we're working across the nations and regions. Uh, my team were responsible for selecting uh, 50,000 items, so half of them. We also wanted to think about the best material. I'll give you a very, very simple example here. If you imagine that we've acquired a uh, one-inch master of an episode of, uh, let's say, Coronation Street or a quiz show, uh, and we have that one-inch master, and then we also have a VHS copy that's being uh, passed over to us by someone who taped it off the television. The one-inch master is going to be more integral in terms of the quality of the image. So in the two examples there, we want to be going for the one-inch rather than the VHS. Associated with that was another criteria, duplication. How do we make sure we're not picking, when we're selecting everything, the one-inch and the same program on the VHS? Because we want to get as much uh, out of the 100,000 as possible, we wanted to do 100,000 different items. So that was a big thing that we uh, kind of attempted. Again, this is just a snapshot uh, that we often present around this, the size of the, the BFI National Archive collection. Uh, it's a lot of uh, stuff in suspiciously round numbers, uh, as a colleague of mine <laughs> often says. But I'll just point out uh, to you uh, the one million plus television programs that we hold. Obviously, we were digitizing uh, in this project uh, 50,000, so you know, le 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 less than 10%. Um, and how do you kind of find your way into that. I should also point out, actually, this digitization project went well beyond kind of television programs. And where it says 140,000 nonfiction films, there we mean actually nonfiction uh, film and video. A lot of the nonfiction industry that was film based in the earlier part of uh, uh, the last century, by the time it moved into uh, the kind of video era, 70s, 80s, 90s, it was uh, a lot of kind of non-fiction film, if you think about industrial film, uh, corporate film, sponsored filmmaking, public information films, a lot of the format there had moved on to, 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 to video. So I think I've presented the problem, the challenge. How did we get into this stuff? One of the things that we did across the regions and archive was to kind of, before we started any digitization, was to kind of have an audit of uh, all of our collections um, across the, the national collections in, in the BFI, uh, in the National Archives uh, in Scotland, uh, Ireland and, 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 and Wales, uh, in Northern Ireland and Wales, uh, and, and across the regions as well. And we basically pulled together this, this kind of matrix uh, questioning what these video collections might be. Uh, I won't go through each of them, but just point out the kind of things that we were looking at. So, for example, grouping together works by the things in the yellow column there, trying to understand where this group of videotapes had come from uh, and why they'd been passed over to a national collection. Uh, alongside that, you might think about the, the, the green column there, trying to understand who owned that particular kind of piece of work there. And rights became a really kind of key issue in this project, slightly different for the, the area that I was responsible for, prioritizing the work we wanted to pri pres preserve, but it became even more acute as we moved into the area that my colleagues are going to go into a little bit later around how, once preserved, we present uh, the stuff and, 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 and be able to kind of offer it to, 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 to the public. Once we'd done our kind of audit, uh, we uh, then brought all of these collections and we started um, looking at them together in order to try and um, work out which of the collections may fit some of the criteria I pointed out a few minutes ago more than others. And what we did was created across all of these different collections, across all these different um, institutions, a top set that we decided were the collections that we were going to dip into. What I'll do is give you an example of not necessarily a top set, but actually a good example of something that didn't make the top set. Um, so, for example, one of the collections in the BFI National Archive, uh, thanks to our friends in Sight and Sound, was throughout the 80s and 90s, a collection of VHS tapes um, that they used for review purposes, perhaps, um, that they passed over to us and are part of our kind of viewing collection. 
but they were VHSs of feature films. Now, obviously, the BFI National Archive will have negatives of, of uh, feature films, The Red Shoes, The Third Man, uh, you name it. And actually, the, the VHSs of those, we didn't feel that they should be digitized because we have the original film material. So that collection is a good example of something that would not make the top set collection. So we had our top set of various different collections. Then the issue was for me and my team, how do you start going into each of those collections to pull out the information needed uh, to make sure that you're actually picking the right items? And a big tool for us was our database and the metadata around that. By metadata, we mean the information around the material. So understanding you know, basically a catalog, uh, a description of the elements held and what they might contain. When you have metadata like this, and this is a nice example of one that, that's been created relating to one of our collections, uh, Video Nation, um, which we were able to kind of dip into and extract that information. Video Nation, one of the collections, uh, is a really um, nice collection for us. Uh, Video Nation, for those of you who may recall, was a series that was actually uh, commissioned by the BBC and played on uh, BBC Two throughout the 90s. And what it was, was a collection uh, of videotapes uh, that people used as kind of video diaries at home. The BBC, uh, cut together those video diaries and, and looked after and, and produced programs. We were not going to be kind of preserving that because that is the remit of the BBC and they looked after that collection. But the raw material, the actual videotape material that had gone into that and the video diaries by the individual contributors is something that has made its way to the BFI National Archive and we thought this is a really good snapshot of kind of the forerunner of vlogging, the kind of thing that you might see uh, on YouTube kind of, you know, 10 years before we got to kind of online um, vlogging. So we thought that was a really nice period in our kind of uh, video making history. So this is a nice data set of metadata. However, metadata doesn't always come in that nice way. And some of the other pieces of metadata we had to deal with were literally scraps of paper. So my team were involved in basically dishing out pieces of paper trying to work out what the videotapes uh, might be. I'll point out this, um, you see this area here, you can see along the top there, that's an old archive number, and you'll notice that it goes down A, B, C, D, E. And what that means is that on one, fi one physical cassette, there are five programs listed in that order, and that's how we understand that. And so that became part of the way we kind of found out what was on parts of the video cassette that hadn't made it to um, the database. When you don't have bits of paper, you have another layer of metadata, which is actually the raw material, the, vi the video cassettes. And there were lots of co collections where we had to kind of really get down to, to that level. Nikki was asking me a couple of days ago um, about uh, capturing the photographs here. If you imagine the, the image of the vault that I showed you earlier, um, knowing that we wanted to work with some of these collections, me and my team, we had uh, two options. We could basically bring the cassettes to our desks and work through them one at a time. Or another option is to go into the vault with a camera and actually take snaps and capture the metadata that way. We did that in the very early stages of the project and it became a really significant factor for us because what it did was allow us to continue working during the pandemic. We'd had the foresight and we'd had the luck to actually take uh, the snaps and so my team were able to transcribe the images that they'd taken during the, the, the time of the pandemic. We were very kind of fortunate to keep that momentum there. Once we'd captured the data, we then had to delve into it to work out what it is that we had. And this is just a snapshot to understand the type of research that my team uh, were doing. So some of the stuff that, that kind of came through was some um, uh, video copies. I know that's an audio cassette, but it's, it's not quite the right image there, but there was an accompanying video cassette. 
uh, for uh, our series of um, Ernest Lindgren lectures, uh, the ones dating back to the 80s. And so my team would kind of literally go to raw material to kind of find out and work out. We knew it was uh, an interview with uh, Edgar Anstey, but, you know, who the interviewer might have been, et cetera, et cetera, uh, was, was a way of kind of populating and providing better metadata. Here's an example uh, of a collection that I worked kind of closely with. Uh, this one has not yet made it to replay, but it's a good example of the kind of uh, material uh, that we wanted to work with. This was a, one of the collection's visions. Uh, basically, in the first two or three years of Channel 4, they commissioned this company, Large Door, to produce um, a series of documentaries about cinema. Um, and yes, they did cover E.T., yes, they did cover Tron and Raiders of the Lost Ark during this era, but they also uh, ran a series of really interesting um, interviews with voices that may not typically have been covered uh, in, in kind of the popular mainstream cinema coverage uh, at that time, and it now provides uh, a really invaluable resource of kind of direct uh, interviews with um, people and their reflections on cinema at that time, including uh, great um, interviews with uh, Wendy Toy, um, who was a prolific filmmaker in the, the 1950s. It's a great example, I think, of the you know what this project was able to do. We were able to basically identify this stuff um, and preserve it. It's now no longer just on the video cassettes. It's now in our um, digital preservation infrastructure, which is a great thing. I'm going to finish off, but before I do so, I'll just present some information about um, how we avoided things like the du duplication um, issues. I'm not going to translate that for you, but believe me, it works. My, my, my team have assured me. This is a nice reflection of the kind of work that I've talked about. It's very kind of curatorial driven, and it was, you know, cultural knowledge and archive skills working together. But with our big kind of data sets and thinking about our, our, our big databases, uh, one of the th things that's really interesting about this project was that mix of kind of cultural, uh, curatorial, archival knowledge uh, and kind of algorithmic uh, responses as well. So this is an example of a piece of API kind of coding that you would punch in to kind of retrieve information back from uh, our database to avoid the issue that I described earlier where you're making sure you're not doing two copies of the same thing. So here's an example here. We've punched in these numbers, and the results that we would get would be basically in the first three lines, it's saying, no, there's a, a duplication here, avoid this. But in the last two lines, it would say to us, yeah, go for it. It's this beta cam SP. And likewise, yep, we think that there's no duplication risk of any duplication here, either within videotapes or possibly, you know, that we may have a film copy or even a digital copy uh, of something already. So go for the DigiBeta. All of that paperwork, et cetera, et cetera, ended up in kind of um, nice data sets. And here's an example of another of the collections, the University of London here. You're going to see a clip of one of them there where we were able to kind of pull together our information and then import it into the data set, improving the metadata uh, that was there. Although I think as Mark pointed out to me, um, actually this was kind of our raw kind of import there, but actually even that didn't reflect uh, maybe the, there's a couple of spelling mistakes in there. So there was yet another iteration uh, of uh, how that uh, stuff could be improved. I think I will stop there uh, and hand over to, do you want to come back or? Yeah, okay. We're going to do some Q&As at the end, so, so save your questions. Um, now, in parallel to all of this, because none of this um, was uh, sequential, this all, was all happening in parallel, um, is the actual videotape digitization process, um, which is still going on now. Uh, and I'd like to invite Andy Wright up, our videotape uh, digitization project manager, to go through that part of the process. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> As Nikki said, I'm the um, I'm Andy Wright, and I'm the videotape uh, project manager for videotape um, digitization strand. Um, it's quite a complex uh, project. So um, what I've done is I've divided it up into sort of six key um, top line activity areas. Um, I'm going to go through them uh, in order, but I mean, as Nikki said, all of these things, like or many of these things, uh, run in uh, we're running in tandem. So. Um, even though I'm going through them individually, a lot of these things are happening at the same time through different teams um, at the BFI and external partners as well. 
Um, so first up, um, the framework suppliers who actually um, did a, a a majority of the digitization. So um, we used a number of different suppliers um, across Europe and um, the UK. Um, there was a vigorous, uh, sort of rigorous um, procurement process, which was via applications to tender. Um, after that process, uh, and the number of uh, suppliers were selected, um, we went then went through a process of um, technical testing. So this was testing um, the formats themselves. So we tested various different um, videotape formats, um, but then also the digital testing. So um, the digitization itself and the capturing of the videotapes, um, the encoding, and then the delivery through to um, the BFI, to just to make sure that whole process um, was working smoothly and ironing out any issues. Um, Different suppliers have different capabilities. Um, so we had rate cards and format lists for each supplier. Um, each supplier could do um, pretty much most of the common formats. So that sort of included the um, sort of Betacam family. Um, those tend to be grouped in sort of the automatic format. So these could be used um, with multiple machines running an automated process. So it didn't need a technician necessarily looking through individual tapes. They could be digitized automatically um, en masse. Um, manual formats, which is sort of, um, as it described, was um, it needed to be manually individually digitized by a technician. So this included things like VHS um, as an example, which obviously many people know about. Um, and then we had rare and very rare formats. So these are the sort of tended to be the much older formats, sort of the open reel formats, sort of one inch, two inch, um, half inch open reel formats, um, and also sort of the less um, commercially widespread formats as well. Um, rate cards varied, but um, it, it depended. Sometimes costs were based per tape, and sometimes it was based on the length of the tape. Um, that caused some challenges because we didn't know the length of a lot of these tapes, if not all of the tapes. Um, so, you know, a lot of budgeting um, challenges were assuming the worst case scenario that they were all two hour long tapes. Um, but luckily that wasn't the case. So we had lots of, um, you know, uh, shorter format um, running tapes. Um, so next up is the sort of preservation spec so this is kind of um, the actual digitization um, and what kind of um, technical specifications we wanted those digitizations um, to be captured at um, we chose the ffv1 matroska so that's um, a digital codec uh, within a um, matroska container um, the reason we chose this is because it's um, an open source lossless um, preservation file format. Um, the FFV1 Matroska format is uh, much smaller than its sort of lossless equivalents. Um, so that was one big advantage to it. So it meant that we could get the same lossless digital file um, transfer, uh, transferred with much less space and data being used, which meant that obviously we could transfer more files faster. Um, the fact that it was open source was a big advantage as well. Um, it was non-proprietary, which means we weren't reliant on any particular businesses. Um, you know, we've got to think about longevity and access as well. Um, so, you know, if we were using a proprietary um, file format, there's risks there that they could go bust. And we've, we've got to think about the long term of preserving these files for the future. Um, it also meant that obviously we can collaborate. So it's a collaborative um, because it's open source. We collaborate and solve issues um, with other organizations um, in the sort of digital domain as well. Um, so that was a big advantage to us. Um, so in terms of the technical specifications, um, they were decided um, obviously at the start of the project and they were outlined in what we call the QEM or quality and exceptions methodology document. This was kind of our Bible for the documents, uh, for the project, sorry. And this outlined all of the technical specifications that we wanted the files delivered in. So things such as the aspect ratio, um, uh, the audio channels and things like this. Um, it also agreed the workflows and the um, agreements that we had with the suppliers and the, um, our partner archives. Um, it docu documented also what we we're looking for when we turn, I'll, I'll come back to a little bit about exceptions later, um, but exceptions are essentially problematic tape. So it outlined what we would consider a problematic tape that wouldn't fit within the sort of mass digitization process. 
Um, so this quality and exceptions methodology document um, was shared amongst, it was all um, agreed and shared amongst all the suppliers and RNA um, regional and na national archive partners. Um, and it was an active um, working draft document. So as challenges came up, we adjusted it and we amended it and reshared it amongst the group, um, amongst all the partners as well. Um, so transport. So this is the sort of physical transportation of, of the tapes themselves. Um, so as my colleagues have already sort of touched on, um, it was 100,000 titles that we were which was the the overall target that we needed to digitize, which equaled about approximately 80,000 physical videotapes. Um, the reason it's a bit lower is because obviously you get multiple titles on one tape. And so you can imagine 80,000 tapes of various different formats um, pose quite a challenge. Um, so what we did early on was um, establish some packing guidelines. This was really important in establishing um, limits on, for example, the number of formats um, we could transport at any one time and number of tapes. Um, we had some standardized crates that all of the archive partners used, including the BFI. And this meant that we could um, figure out the number of tapes of each format would fit in one crate. And we also included weight limits on that for obviously health and safety reasons, but also helped with calculating transportation costs and things like that as well. Um, this also included um, how we would pack and you know, protect the tapes themselves to avoid any damage in transit. So obviously, like how they're crated and obviously how they're palleted as well. Um, as mentioned, we were using suppliers in, in Europe as well as the UK, so we had to consider international transportation. Um, obviously with Brexit coming about, there's obviously some challenges there um, that came about in the middle of the project um, to do with customs challenges and things like that. Um, so that was quite a new um, aspect to, to factor in as well. Each tape needed to be barcoded. Um, this has had a couple of reasons for it. Um, it needed, we needed to use the barcode or we used the tape reference that was on the tape itself already. Um, this was a way of tracking the tape, but that tape barcode or tape reference was also used ultimately as the file name once it, the tape had been digitized. All of the tapes were tracked in tracking sheets that were um, accessible by the individual archive partners and the suppliers. Um, this was really helpful and useful in that we were all accessing the same document, these live documents throughout the project. It meant that the archive partners could see tapes individually as they were digitized and could see the progress of each batch, but also meant that we could liaise and flag up any issues um, as they arose as well. Um, so the tracking sheets were um, very important, as I said, in this process. Um, on the tracking sheets themselves, we also included links to the digitized, uh, sort of a low quality version MP4 of the actual preservation file itself. Um, and this, I'll explain this a, a bit more later in the QC, um, but helped um, view the, the tapes, for, um, the files, if there were any issues from the digitization process. The tracking sheets we used um, also to track each individual batch. Um, obviously, with that many tapes, we had to divide it up into smaller batches. Um, and they were staged and phased out. Um, batches would be shipped out to different suppliers and then shipped back as, shipped back as they were complete. Um, as soon as they were complete, they weren't necessarily shipped back straight away. The reason for this is that if issues were flagged up, we were able to catch them. And then the tapes would still be present at the supplier. So if the supplier needed to check the tape to see if the issue that might have been presented on the file was um, present on the tape itself, and they'll be able to confirm that on the tape and then re-digitize the tape if needed. And all of this information was logged on the tracking sheets throughout. Um, there was a lot of considerations with the transport of the tapes themselves. Um, the formats varied considerably in size and weight um, and numbers as well. And as I said, this different supplies had different capabilities of what formats they could digitize. So there was quite a lot of complexity in figuring out where you would send these different batches of tapes. So as well as the rate cards and the different formats um, each supplier could do. It also included information such as the number of videotape players themselves of each format they had available. Um, this is obviously a big consideration as well because you don't want to send a thousand VHS tapes to a supplier and they've only got one VHS player. So obviously because that would take them forever to digitize. So things like this are another aspect of um, the complexities of working out the transportation of the tapes themselves. 
Uh, the tapes, as I said, were packed and sent to suppliers and phased in and out in different batches. Um, as Nikki's already said, that digitization process is still going on. We're almost at the end of the process. Um, and as I've mentioned, the length of the tape was varied. So knowing how long it would take to digitize each batch was a bit of an unknown. So there's a lot of estimation involved with when batches would go out. So, um, you know, we tended to give three months for digitization turnaround time for each batch. Um, but sometimes that could stretch much, much longer than that. Um, and it would depend um, supplier to supplier and obviously their capabilities. Um, as it's sort of been touched on already, um, the equipment with that the suppliers are using is very old and not necessarily manufactured anymore and so parts are liable to wear out and machinery can wear out and so that was also a consideration as part of this mass digitization project is that tapes that were being digitized by the suppliers very much needed to be um, easily processed if any tapes you know showed signs of any particular com more complex issues they were put to one side and that was considered an exception tape um, to be processed um, in a separate process, which I'll come to, come on to in a in a moment. Um, so, digitization and transport the digital files themselves. Um, so, the suppliers, when they had the tape, would digitize them first to a MOV format, and they would then transcode them to our um, FFV1 Matroska um, for file file preservation format, and it would then be delivered to the BFI. Um, via the internet, um, well not the internet, via direct link processes. Uh, the files were then checked once they arrived at the BFI. They were checked through an automated process, so we had um, a software, again open source software, to process these. Um, so it was com the, the software would compare it against the technical specifications that we'd outlined in the um, QEM document. And it would also verify that there was no loss of data in the transcoding process. Assuming the files were past that process, the files would then be ingested into our digital preservation infrastructure. Um, so this is the sort of long-term preservation, sort of the final stage of the digitization and preservation process. As for tracking and QC, I've kind of touched on some of the tracking using the tracking sheets with suppliers and our regional archives um, partners. Um, but the suppliers themselves would do a lot of the QC. We um, had a minimum three point check for each supplier. So they would check the, each tape at the beginning, the middle and the end of the tape to check for any issues. Um, and obviously, as I said, if they spot any issues or any tapes turn out to be problematic for whatever reason, um, we had a list of possible issues um, that we'd already outlined and um, scoped out at the start of the project. Um, so suppliers were able to quickly check any problematic tapes against these predefined issues with videotapes and put them to one side um, to follow the exceptions process. Another QCing process was the, um, the regional and national archive partners themselves. So as I mentioned, they had access to a sort of lower quality version um, MP4 viewable file that they could uh, view through the, um, through the tracking sheets. So we had a feedback process where they could view the files and they had 30 days to review each file and then give us feedback, at which point we would flag up to the supplier. The supplier would check the tape. Um, we would have our own in-house archive technical specialists also check the file to confirm whether it's likely to be an issue with the digitization process or whether it could be actually inherent on the, the format um, with known issues with that particular format um, or what could be expected generally from the videotape given its age um, and past use as well. And finally, um, the exception. So as I kind of covered, any problematic tapes that have been flagged up by our regional partners or by suppliers would become exception tapes. So as I mentioned, these tapes are problematic tapes essentially, but they are tapes that uh, don't fit within the sort of predefined efficient mass digitization process that we established through the suppliers. Um, these tapes that are identified as exceptions were all brought in-house to the BFI at our National um, Conservation Center in Berkhamsted, and they were um, then assessed and processed and digitized um, by our archive technical specialists. 
Um, so I've got a clip of a few um, examples. Um, just they're very short clips, but it gives you a sort of taster of some of the work that went on behind the scenes of um, some of that exceptions work. So I'll sort of explain what's happening here in these two clips. Um, so if we could run the um, the video file, please. So here you can see a Betacam SP tape, and as you can see, there's um, mold visible on through the window, um, which is the white sort of. Um, material you can see on the tape itself and once the cassette flap is open you can see the tape is missing it's been sn it's snapped where the mold has actually eaten through the tape itself um, and here on the right on the monitor on the right you can see um, the first digitization of an m2 tape um, it, clearly you can so show, show uh, it shows some issues um, the loss of data in the picture is from the dirty tape causing head clocking head clogging issues and then the capture on the left on the monitor on the left is um, the tape having gone through um, the second process with the digitization in-house um, after it's been inspected, heat treated, cleaned, and then digitized. So as you can see there, um, there's a very clear improvement having gone through our sort of more hands-on process. I think that's a really good example of some of the, you know, the expertise um, that's needed and the work that's needed on these videotapes to make them playable. And it really demonstrates um, the big impact it has um, with these tapes. So not necessarily um, just digitizing them. It's not necessarily a straightforward process. There needs to be a lot of preservation work and uh, manual sort of um, expertise to handle these tapes and get them ready for that digitization. So here we've got some nice um, stats to share. Um, so as mentioned, the target was 100,000 titles that we were planning to preserve for um, the videotape digitization strand. Um, as I said, digitization is still going on. We've got the last few tapes, which will be finishing at the end of this month. Um, but we've actually hit um, an overall target at the moment of 104,000 titles saved. Um, so we've actually surpassed our target, which is really great news. Um, so on here, you can see sort of um, some rough stats on the left. Um, you can see that um, out of that 104,000 um, titles that we've digitized, 25,000 of those were BFI physical tapes. 55,000 um, were from regional and national archive partners. Um, the largest tape um, format that we digitized as part of the project was probably the two inch quadruplex, um, which is also the oldest videotape. Um, it can weigh up to 13 kilograms and 15 inches by 15 inches by four inches, but the tape itself is two inches, as the name suggests. Um, these are very weighty tapes. Um, obviously, due to the size of them, um, you can only lift one tape at a time, um, and they have to be put on pallets, and there was obviously a limit on the number of tapes you could put per pallet. Um, so when we're dealing with hundreds of these tapes, there's big considerations with the logistics of moving them, um, especially internationally. And the smallest tape we digitized within the project itself was the mini DV, um, which as you can see is much smaller in comparison at sort of two inches um, by two inches approximately. Um, there are smaller video tapes, but this was the smallest one that we did for the project. Um, and I think another interesting stat for the project is um, the top 10 formats by volume. Um, you'd think that actually when you think about video tapes, a lot of people, I mean, perhaps myself before I started this project, was that you, know, you tend to think of the commercial um, sort of more um, sort of uh, uh, consumer formats that we're all familiar with, such as VHS and Betamax. Um, but actually they make up a very small proportion, as you can see, of the total. Uh, obviously the majority were digital Betacam and they were um, uh, a vast majority of the titles that are digitized. But this also leads into what, um, what Dylan was touching on earlier, is the fact that these were better quality formats. Um, and broadcast quality tapes and content. Um, so we digitized over 25 different videotape formats and variants. Um, there are many more types of different videotapes than that, but this was within the project. Um, there's various different stock types within each of those different formats, so it actually layers up even further than those 25 formats. Um, but as you can see, it's quite an interesting um, number of stats um, from Cross. And as I said, these numbers are a snapshot of where we are at the project so far. Um, and these numbers are still going up as digitization is coming um, to an end and, and still completing. And that is it for me. So I will pass on to my colleague, Mark. Thanks, everyone.
Um, Mark's going to come and talk about actually the, the curation and how we took the digitization, digitized tapes and brought them onto replay. It, because we um, digitized as an open source file, we then had to switch uh, the process from uh, preservation to presentation. And one of the things that uh, we often talk about the technical side, but actually what was really significant was then what we selected from that digitization process to actually go on to replay and only uh, so that we only were um, ingesting and converting uh, that number of um, files. So I'd like to welcome Mark to talk about the actual content uh, strategy and how him and his team went about that. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> So I wanted to start with a, a question of sorts, um, which might seem simple and, and, and obvious. The question is, what is a collection? Um, and it does seem a very simple question, but it turned out to be quite a thorny one um, for us. We use the word collection a lot in the archive world. Um, I imagine this is true of most archives. It's certainly true at the BFI. And we, we talk about the collections or the collection. You've heard us talk about the collections of the regional and national archive partners of the BFI. Um, uh, but we also talk about curated collections, which might be quite small numbers of things. And there are many sort of divisions. So um, it became quite important to actually nail down a little bit um, uh, something of what collections might mean in different contexts. Collection, as a word, implies a, a, an active gathering together of stuff. Um, it implies a selective process. It's not random. Um, and therefore, it implies some common properties um, between those things. But what common properties? And obviously, we're talking about a moving image collection, effectively, uh, essentially. Uh, although there are things in our collections which are not moving image, of course. But they're to do with the world of moving images. Um, we have top-level characteristics that we can talk about. So w whether film things are film or television or video. Um, they might be more than one of those things, um, which can get tricky. Whether things are fiction or non-fiction. Um, formats, we've talked a lot about formats already. Uh, top level film, video or video file. 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, 70 millimeter film, eight millimeter film, nine and a half millimeter film. So many. Uh, I'm not gonna list all the digital, all the video formats again. Um, we could also talk about provenance. Um, so collections might, might tell us a bit about provenance. Um, the broadcaster, the ITV collection, uh, the donor, uh, the rights holder, uh, the production company, the acquisition. Um, so one collection that's relatively well known, perhaps to some of you, is the Mitchell and Kenyon collection. This is quite a good example of a collection because um, it includes it, it has sort of several, several sort of built-in common char characteristics. It's all apparently from one production outfit, the Mitchell and Kenyon Partnership, which was the beginning of the uh, 20th century, or well, end of end, very end of the 19th, 1899-ish, I think, is the earliest earliest film in the collection, um, up to about 1913, um, and it came to us through a single donation, um, largely. Um, we tend to call it the Peter Warden Mitchell and Kenyon collection because that was the donor. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was all nonfiction, except when you inspect these things, none of these things are completely true. It's also, it was also integral, not entire, but it was integral. But again, it's like none of these things are quite true. Um, it, was, it is not the only Mitchell and Kenyon, it doesn't include the only Mitchell and Kenyon titles in our collections. It turned out we had quite a lot already, some of which we knew we had, others which we identified as Mitchell and Kenyon because of our greater understanding of that collection. Um, uh, it's not entire. Um, the Peter Warden collection is the stuff that we got at the BFI, but other, other parts of that collection went elsewhere uh, before they came to the BFI. Uh, mostly fiction, but not only fiction. So there was a significant amount of fiction work that Mitchell and Kenyon had, had created, in fact, that was what they were really known for before we, we, we acquired this collection and came to understand them better. Anyway, I don't want to get into a long pre-video story, but I just wanted to, to sort of tease out some of the issues about what a collection is. And Dylan mentioned a little bit about the audit. And the reason why I'm saying this stuff, I suppose, because it is touching on pre-curation, if you like, but it isn't really, because all of these things are curatorial issues. 
you, the process of, of, of making decisions um, for, a, for, for what to put before a public audience begins with selection. This was a preservation project, as, as I think Nikki said at the beginning, but it was a preservation project that came to have a necessary public access component. And so all the preservation decisions we make affect the, uh, the public access outcomes we, we, we later kind of sculpt, if you like. Um, and the collection entities we were able to sort of describe in that audit process, you know, created challenges for us. So this is a sort of random collection of, of stuff. I, I, I'm not going to address these things particularly. There, there could be a quiz at the end, if you like, about how many things people can identify. Um, anybody gets all 27. Deserves a, a drink at least. Um, I can't, to be honest. I think I've forgotten some of them. <laughs> but um, but uh, the, the, so the collections that we were able to identify, the collections that sort of already kind of pre-existed, those top-level collections, the film collection, the TV collection, the ITV collection, the big donations, they weren't actually terribly helpful in lots of ways for what we needed. So the audit process itself demanded that we created new collection entities, um, many new <laughs> collection entities. I, I think it was about 70 in the end, wasn't it, Dylan? Um, and we spent a lot of time wading through enormous spreadsheets. Um, 40, 50,000 lines was common. Um, uh, trying to sort of identify patterns, and th there were some obvious ones we could we could talk about donors, uh, and we did a lot of looking at donors information. But um, the question was, how kind of useful were, did these decisions that we made early on become later in the project? So we were trying to marry um, the, the the information that we needed for preservation, for curation, for rights, um, and ultimately for creating our. Uh, our public access offer. Um, and I'm not sure we completely succeeded. I don't think it was ever really possible. Um, and inevitably, the kind of the interests of preservation, because of the scale of the project, uh, were kind of paramount. And um, we were never going to offer 100,000 titles, by the way, or 100,000 items to the public, um, I'm afraid, not in one go anyway, um, because of the complexities of things like rights, um, quite apart from just the sheer scale of the task. Um, so the problems, the problems in those of, of those collections were, were were things like the scale. I mean, as I think was uh, Andy said, two thirds of the videotape collection is television. So television as a as a category is not very helpful, um, and the data wasn't easily passable to, for example, talk about genre. Uh, we did a little bit of identification by genre uh, where the data was kind of obvious. Um, so. Um, we ended up with these very, very large units, um, and we really had to start find other ways to start understanding it better. It's worth saying at this point, and I, I'm not sure if it's come out, as, uh, uh, if it's been obvious in, in some of the talks so far, but we were not familiar with these 100,000 items in full. Um, I haven't personally watched them. Um, I personally watched a number of them. It doesn't come up to a very high proportion of that 100,000. Uh, and I hadn't watched lots of them before this project. Um, so we weren't, we didn't, it, and it wasn't one of the better known bits of the collection. We, we, we know the film collection proportionally rather better than we knew the videotape collection. It was more accessible. We didn't have the equipment to watch quite a lot of these video formats. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we had our DVD players and our VHS players and our Betacam players, and not, a very, not very many of the other players we would have needed, accessible to most of us. So we needed to kind of find a new way. And one of the things that we did at the start of, the, uh, sort of the fairly early in this project, a little bit kind of into the audit, as I remember, but um, ahead of the kind of final selection process, was to start doing what I, we called mapping the video landscape. So this was a bit of a sort of, you know, imaginative ex an exercise of imagination and history, I suppose, to try to think back to and, you know, use our knowledge, collective knowledge, um, and the sources available, historical sources available to us, to try to sort of imaginatively recreate the landscape of video production. We're talking about 50 years, uh, more or less. Um, the, first, the first Ampex two-inch quad tape was, I think, 1956. They, they were sort of bedding into television in the late 50s, early 60s. And the you know, last video formats were around 2010-ish, sort of began moving to video file rather than physical tape. 
So we wanted to understand that video landscape, if you like, the ecosystem of video, um, of video production, which is a pretty rich thing. Television is, of course, by far the largest component of it, and that's the bit we understood best, and that is an enormous subject in itself. Videotape is not all, was not all television production, but it was by far the greater part of it quite quickly. Um, film was used for, as, as I'm sure many of you will know, for kind of high-end production. Um, uh, international sales was quite important for film, so, so uh, because video didn't travel so well, um, and not all countries had a, a thriving video industry. But um, so, so video really kind of changed the landscape of production. But it's not just television; it was you know whole new sectors thro w were thrown up. Um, music video being a, a you know a, a, a well-known one but you know all sorts of production I mean Dylan you alluded to training industrial video and training videos charity video lots and lots of different things that we kind of identified in our in our data sets um, and and you know fleshed out our understanding of this so that became a really important exercise in actually in the selection process as well, because we wanted to, I mean, we, we wanted, to, we were concerned with that riskness, we were concerned with cultural significance, but we were also concerned to be representative of that kind of ecosystem of video. So, you know, we wanted to, to save the insects as well as the kind of the higher mammals, um, if you like. Um, some of the insects. <laughs> um, so, having done that exercise, um, we, went, we, 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 we wanted to sort of take it from the other end, I suppose. So we wanted to, to understand our potential users. As Nikki said, we, 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 we knew we wanted to, to, to launch a, 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 an offer in public libraries. So we did some research, or some colleagues did some research, into UK public libraries and their users. Um, and uh, sort of separately to that, we began workshopping with BFI colleagues about the kind of thing that we could kind of product, if you like, that we could build with the material we had. And bringing those two together, we identified some themes. So um, libraries, of course, are, are, are very much situated in communities. They're public spaces in a particular locale. Um, uh, they're places where people do local historical research and uh, all sorts of local groups might meet. So themes that emerged from that were essentially three main themes. So one was place and community. One was shared memory, local or national. Uh, and the other one is one that the BFI and its partners tend to bring to anything, which is screen history uh, and culture. So the nature of our collections obviously supports that, and those are the stories that we're comfortable telling, and I'm not apologizing. Um, we then kind of took that further with kind of curator workshops, bringing together uh, colleagues across our team to kind of scope out, working from the content, how we might address those themes. And out of that, and it fell to me, oh joy, to, to put that together as a content strategy. A strategy that kind of set out how we would curate that content for audiences in public libraries. Now, that's an act of imagination. It's not science. I mean, you, you can be informed by all sorts of things. But in the end, and you know, you can, you, 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 we were informed by the research and our understanding of those audiences. But in the end, turning those lists of videotapes and their contents, which were quite abstract to us at first, many of them. Uh, I've lost count of the number of titles I've seen called sort of, you know, FC, FC124, uh, that sort of thing. Um, not all of them very self-descriptive. Turning, so turning that into something to put before the public is, is an imaginative act, not a scientific uh, set of principles. And it has to be, of course, based on the content available uh, and the stories we find in it. And fundamentally, I think, you know, when we talk about Curation. I think storytelling is a huge part of it. So, um, we came up with an approach built around what we we called the three, well, initially three, later four pillars. So these were sort of broad, top-level narrative categories. Um, they were the time machine. So, this was about fundamentally about things about events, major historical, national, local events, things that had happened. So we, we had quite a lot of material across our various collections on the minor strike, 1984-85, for example, on the AIDS pandemic. Um, we decided we would have collections on the major decades as far as possible, 
um, of the, the history of video. There's one coming on the 80s and 90s. It may be more of a struggle, as it turns out, based on uh, the regional partners collect, regional national partners collections to do the 60s and 70s, but we'll do our best. But we also, one of my favorite collections, I'm, it would have been great if the, the right slide was up now, but that was never going to happen. Um, one of my favorite collections from, from that one was That Was the Future, which is a look from sort of the, uh, the, 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 the now distant past on what our, I guess what our world would, would be like, the world that we now live in. Um, I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, we had our second pillar was the making of us. Uh, this was split into what we called among ourselves nationwide collections, so ones that all of the archives could contribute to. So these were on things like how we worked, how we learned, what we read, which is quite apposite for public libraries. Um, that actually works. Kathy Acker is in our What We Read collection. Um, serendipity. Um, then we had our regional and, nation and national collections, so our North Wales, the Great Midlands pub crawl, um, Silicon Fen, keeping London moving on transport. Uh, then we had our screen stories. Um, so behind the screen, which was interviews with filmmakers, programmes about film and television production and the like, TV soaps, proving already quite a hit, um, kids TV, multicultural TV, uh, a collection called Be Careful Out There about public inf information films. Um, and coming soon, I hope, the story of video itself. And finally, we had a, a sort of wrap-up collection we called Closer to Home, which was where the RNA's um, Regional National Archive partners could, could sort of bring together their own collections so that people could find them. So there was a, you know, there's a Scotland section and a, a Midland section, a Southwest section and so on. Okay, um, I've got a couple of clips. Um, so the first one is I mentioned from that um, Time Machine collection. Uh, and it's from a, 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 a COI campaign, a government campaign from 1982, which was the year of, designated the year of information technology. This was apparently a panicked response to a survey in 1981 that, that I think only about 20% uh, of UK population even knew what the terms in, term information technology meant. Um, and this was something of a concern, given that it was already reckoned to be the future. Um, so this, this series of videos was produced, starring and, and co-written partly by Tom Vernon. Some people might remember Tom Vernon as the fat man on a bicycle. Anyway, so that's my first clip. My second, because I'll run back to back, is from an, an LWT multicultural show from the sort of late, I think it began about 1979, uh, into the early 80s, called Skin. Um, and this is about blues parties, um, you know, black British celebrations of music, um, partly an import from Jamaica and, and the Caribbean. Um, if, you, if you saw um, Small Axe, uh, the series of what, 18 months or two years ago, there was a fantastic episode of Small Axe about uh, an equivalent sort of party. Anyway, um, if you could play the first two clips, please, John. The cumbersome, delicate stereo LP is on its way to join the wax phonograph in the museum. The new compact digital disc is five inches across with an hour of music on it. And it doesn't matter if you scratch it because it's digital and it's scanned by laser. Like a new publishing medium, the video disc. Now look what you can do to this. Draw a nail across it and it still plays. It's because of all these club closures that the blues parties have begun to revive again. Once more, West Indians in London have nowhere else to go for the kind of Saturday night entertainment that they want. The trouble is, the new generation of blues parties breaks more laws than before. Relations with police are in a worse state than ever, and community workers are genuinely worried that the new wave of parties could end in racial clashes as white neighbours on council estates where blues parties take place can no longer stand the noise. Yeah, I mean, the interesting framing, that one, I'm not sure whether an uh, equivalent programme would put it quite like that. Um, also, the, the, yeah, the, DV, the, the, the video disc can bear a certain amount of scratching, but, I mean, in your dreams, is it indestructible? Um, as we now know, hindsight. So, um, 
I want to talk a little bit about challenges, just to conclude. So, um, I mean, we've already uh, addressed some challenges already. One of the fundamental ones is that selection for preservation and selection for public access are not the same thing. Um, uh, I, many of us came, from, uh, came into Heritage 22 on the back of a previous project, Unlocking Film Heritage, out of which came Britain on Film, which was quite successful. Um, that project was, was, was fundamentally a public access project from the start, um, and, the, pres and the, the selection criteria really you know, reflected that. So we, we intended to do something called Britain on Film. We intended to have representation of every element, as far as we could, of every kind of region and, 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 and bit of the UK, actually, every, every political constituency we were trying to do. I'm not sure we quite got there, but we did a pretty good job. Um, so you start from a different place if you're, you're going to do public access from the start. But this was a big preservation project. I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not complaining, by the way, but it's a, it's a different set of, uh, of, of decisions, I suppose. Uh, R&D, uh, curatorial R&D, needed to happen as a result of the, 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 the project's kind of uh, timetable, needed to happen in parallel with selection for preservation. Um, and curators, whether it's the BFI's curators or, or curators in the regions and nation, national archives, had set eyes on very little of this stuff, unless you count actually looking at the tape, um, the outside of it. Um, so R&D wasn't easy, and also often we couldn't actually see the contents of a tape until it had gone through digitization. So there were quite a few logistical hurdles. Resource, of course, in any project is, is, is difficult. The scale of this, though, whether we're talking about the, 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 the original 100,000 or just the, what, 10,000 or so that we, we, we aim to have by the end of this year, um, we can't contextualize that volume of stuff. We're not that many. <laughs> Uh, and we don't have time to view that volume of stuff. So we ended up with a kind of uh, a compromise. We divided things into two, divided our platform into two things. We call it, we, we, we talk about among ourselves, we talk about the curated layer, which is content that's been seen, to some extent contextualized, curated into collections. And then we talk about the well. Um, largely unseen, often unknown, um, uncontextualized and possibly a little bit dark. Um, uh, which brings us on to one of the other challenges, which I think we, you know, we've come across before, of course, but perhaps not on the scale that, that, that we had here, which is the issue of content standards and safeguarding. Um, we have obviously a responsibility to, 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 to protect our audiences to some extent, not mollycoddle, but to give information at the very least about the content of things. And that's hard if we haven't seen it. We, we're able to make some judgments about the nature of some kinds of content. Um, uh, we were fairly confident about some types, of con some types of content, but we're dealing with a period here, with the age of video, as I said, roughly the early 60s, um, bits of late 50s, but roughly the early 60s to the 2010, but encompasses Things like light entertainment in the 1970s and 80s, um, pretty rife with racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist humour. Um, plenty of plenty of other problematic material. That's not the only kind of problematic material. Um, one of one of the categories that proved a challenge was medical training video. We have quite a lot of medical training video. It's quite graphic. Um, I mean. Doctors are fine with this kind of stuff. Um, so we had to make a number of decisions. I mean, we also had to bear in mind this is a public library context. So it's, there's one thing saying, you know, our, our audiences, of course, should be able to make decisions about what they want, want to watch in the context of their own homes and providing them a bit of information to, to make, um, you know, informed decisions. It's something else when we we're talking about you know, audiences watching in the context of a public library where somebody may be watching over their shoulders. So we decided... We made a few basic decisions. One was that we don't have a duty to publish. Uh, it's not censorship. Um, stuff is being held in the archive. There are other ways in which people can access uh, content if they really choose to, but we don't have a duty to put things into public libraries. So we did make decisions on things that we thought were not appropriate, uh, including some medical training films. Um, we developed a set of guideline principles for recognizing sensitive content. Sometimes it was identifying types of content that might 
be problematic. For example, um, even things like uh, films and training things by training videos by disability charities would include terminology that we would not feel comfortable using today. Um, sometimes it's appropriate to simply include a warning to that effect. Um, sometimes we might take more radical action. But we need to establish some guideline principles. These were reflected published guidelines from organisations like the British Broadcast, uh, the BBFC um, and the BBC. Um, from there, we developed and implemented a, 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 a set of content and trigger warnings, a sort of an approach to adding content and trigger warnings, which would be visible wherever we identified sensitive content in a video. And we also uh, built in a reporting tool, which would allow uh, users to notify us of anything they found about things we didn't know about, um, which they thought were offensive or concerning. So that's kind of what I'm, where I'm going to end. But on a lighter note, um, I, I, I picked a couple of clips um, to see us out. The first one um, is actually came up in Dylan's presentation, coincidentally, which is from a, a University of London um, audio visual centre, quite a prolific uh, early adopter of, of video in, in an HE context. Um, and a series of, of uh, videos they, they created called In Conversation, which was interviews with mostly filmmakers. This one is from 1972 um, and features, well, the clip only features Mike Lee, but it was uh, an interview with Mike Lee and Les Blair, um, who uh, directed a producer partnership on the film Blink Moments, um, which had fairly recently come out, released by B BFI, um, Mike Lee's first feature film. The second one um, won't need much introduction to many of you. Um, it's an, I think, 1968 Coronation Street Christmas special called Christmas on the Street. So I will end there. Thank you. I think the main thing about Bleak Moments uh, in relation to other films, apart from the budget thing, was that, in fact, uh, we were able to make a film without any compromise at all in terms of the content, yeah. in terms of... Um, uh, everything that went into the film. Um, there were no pressures, uh, except the pressures that arise out of doing things um, on a low budget, but there was complete freedom, artistic freedom. Mm. Uh, and the, that relates to the question of where we started, in that there wasn't a script, actually there wasn't a dialogue script. Um, there was an idea, there was a basic outline for the sort of theme and the sort of characters we were going to explore. Uh, but in fact, we... Um, wanted to, we were successful, luckily, in being able to do what we wanted to do, which was to rehearse for a long period before shooting anything mm. and doing a lot of improvisation. Now that old Jungle Rums has had the best of the bird, perhaps I can make a start. Oh, I hope you like it. Well, seeing as how your mother's had all the breast, I hope we do. We could have told you how to make the most of it. Well, I like to do it myself at Christmas. Ah, I shall we notice. Martha, goodwill to all men, includes Minnie Colwell. She may be willful, but she's human, and she is our friend. Um, thank you. Well, I hope you recognise some of those old films there, old uh, uh, programmes. Um, so we are running a little bit behind, so we wanted to allow some time for uh, Q&As. But I'm, finally, we have Katie Reddington, last but by no means least. So Katie was really significant. She's our outreach librarian um, at the BFI Rubin Library. Um, and as well as her in her day job, was everyone here at the BFI I wanted to point out was uh, was been delivering the lottery programme on top of their day jobs. Um, so I have a lot to be thankful to for, as well as delivery manager. Um, but Katie uh, led on the role at BFI Replay um, with the Replay Library founding network and across the UK. Um, and I just want to bring up Kate just to talk about the, the next steps then, and how, how, how we co sort of worked with the libraries to do this. Thank you. Um, so I'll be quick because I know we're running out of time a little bit, but um, I'm basically going to stand here and talk about how amazing public libraries are and how important they've been to the process um, we've gone through on the Heritage 2022 project. Um, so I'm Katie Reddington, as Nikki said, I'm an outreach librarian um, and I've only been at the BFI for two years. So I was sort of um, very quickly brought into the Heritage 22 project to help with outreach and engagement across our library services. So I just want to introduce you to our founding partner libraries. As you've probably noticed from my other colleagues that have spoken tonight, um, 
this project hasn't been able to be completed in isolation and it's really taken a village to get to the point that we're at now. Um, Replay was designed for exclusive use in public libraries and we knew we couldn't create a video on demand platform without the input and feedback from li librarians. Um, so in as early as 2019, colleagues in the BFI digital team who are the people um, involved with actually developing the platform, uh, they reached out to our regional and national film archive partners that we've talked about a few times this evening, um, really to ask for introductions to their local libraries, to people that they've been working with for years. You know, the BFI has great connections with libraries as well, but we wanted to connect RNAs and libraries together as well. When I say RNAs, I mean the Regions and Nations Film Archives, by the way. Um, and really that sort of instigated the beginnings of a collaboration with libraries. Um, and these initial conversations resulted in what we now call the founding partner libraries, um, all 12 of which you can see on screen. I'm not going to read that out. Um, and our founding partner libraries, they've been with us every step of the way, helping to inform and shape and develop the platform, which um, was incredibly valuable. And we are really, really thankful for these library services. Um, we didn't want to create anything in isolation and we wanted to make sure that everything we did worked for libraries and for the people that go in to use library resources. Um, so as you can see from the map, um, we were keen to bring together the widest possible geographical spread of library services to ensure a good spread of regions and all nations in the UK were consulted in part of this process. And so it's my job um, to work with all members of the Founding Library Partners Network and to understand their library service setup to encourage knowledge sharing, arrange feedback sessions, um, and set up initial BFI replay user testing and ultimately soft launch the platform across their library services. So how did we go about it? Um, so our initial steps were to do some sort of discovery work with libraries to explore how they're run and it won't surprise you to learn that all libraries are run differently. Um, our 12 founding partner libraries are run by local authorities, some are out arts council funded charities and all of them have a huge amount of volunteer run branches. So it was really important for us to understand how libraries operate and who are using the spaces and the resources. So we reached out to partners, including the Reading Agency and to Libraries Connected, who, if you've never heard of them before, are organisations that work with library services across the UK. Um, and they were able to provide us vital information and guidance about this project and how we develop something with them in mind. Um, and alongside that, you know, we were speaking to our um, library partners on a weekly basis in many cases, and they were providing information, usage stats, um, helping us to get to the crux of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, and how can a video on-demand streaming service help to um, supplement the work that they already do with the people coming through their libraries? And concurrently to that, we were running many, many uh, Zoom calls and in-person, in-depth research sessions with our librarians just to discover how they envisioned uh, streaming service would work with their library users as well. And that really was the most enriching part of the process. It was so brilliant to learn what library colleagues discuss, um, to listen to our library colleagues discuss the amazing work that they do and how the platform can contribute to that. You know, I'm a librarian, but it's very specifically for the BFI Rubin Library, which is, uh, you know, a, a library about film and television and moving image and is an academic library in many cases. But, you know, these public libraries, I knew a lot, but I didn't, you know, I learned so much more from this project. Um, we learned that libraries do a lot and, you know, they run things from book clubs, knitting sessions, board game sessions. They do small business support sessions. The local history groups go in and out of libraries, you know, storytelling for toddlers, things that you know that you've seen in your local library. They do all that. The list is endless. But, you know, on top of it as well, it was clear through these discussions how important um, certain groups are for library spaces. Um, almost all of our library partners spoke about reminiscence sessions um, and how BFI Replay could enhance these group meetings with the nostalgic content that's on there. For anybody who's unaware and not heard of reminiscent, reminiscence sessions, which is really hard to say, um, 
but these sessions are aimed at um, people suffering from dementia. They come to a library space and they have memory boxes that um, they can access to try and activate memories and, you know, pro provide a sense of nostalgia and, and warm feeling. And this is something that runs across most UK public libraries um, that they do in and above the usual lending of books. Um, they also discussed how BFI Replay could be a tool to support with teaching English as a second language. Many, many of the libraries that we worked with um, advised that this type of work takes place in their library spaces, especially with re refugees and people who have recently arrived in the UK. Um, and it would be remiss of me to not mention the Warm Spaces initiative that I'm sure all of you heard about um, last winter with libraries becoming a real support system for many people to stay warm during the cost of living crisis. And we discussed how important BFI Replay and this screen heritage that we're making available um, could be in, in those kinds of situations as well. What we also learned is uh, libraries are incredibly stretched. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the different things that have happened to public libraries and lending libraries across the last decade. Um, the landscape's quite different to what it used to be. And um, library teams were in full need of support to help roll out a brand new product, product to their library users and to their staff as well. And their feedback has been completely integral in terms of what we developed to help support the use of this um, product across the, the teams. Um, they give us a huge amount of feedback on creation of materials to help report, um, support the rollout. And we also did a lot of work with the British Library and the Reading Agency and um, Libraries Connected as well to fully understand what staff need to promote and utilize the platform. Um, so this, this work sort of informed the marketing assets and training tools that we developed to go alongside um, the sign up process. So we've created user guides, onboarding videos. It turns out no librarian has time to join many training sessions. And so it's easy for them to understand a product by looking at videos in their spare time. We drafted social media copy so that people are confident with posting out a tweet about a new product for their library service. Um, our library partners were also really fundamental with just the the actual testing of BFI Replay before we were at a stage to launch. Um, even when we were at the minimal viable product stage, basically at the stage where the platform is just about ready to be tested and potentially broken, um, it was at this stage that we went out to libraries. We asked library users, people that are going in regularly along with staff to have a look at the platform, tell us what we're doing, tell us what we need to improve, what would be more important for libraries. Um, and it was from these feedback sessions that we did get um, some development. Oh, I'm lost my track here. But basically, it's from these sessions that librarians said to us, it's really important that there is a collection that's related to sense of place. And that's where the pillar that Mark was talking about closer to home comes in. We realized that people are really keen to connect with their regional stories. And so that pillar was designed with libraries and library users in mind. Oh, sorry. They're also extremely instrumental in the development of our authentication process because not, not only do we need to digitize videotapes, but we also are providing access to them via a, a platform. But we also need to find a way to sign libraries up in an easy way that will be able to allow us to whitelist IP addresses and allow access. And so our library services were really important in helping us develop that process, um, which has re resulted in a portal access management system that we fondly call PAM, because that's the abbreviation. Um, and once PAM was ready to go, we were we signed up our founding library partners first, and we began the rollout of the platform across their services, um, running soft launch events across the libraries to ensure the platform worked as we expected. Um, and because we really wanted to celebrate with our library teams and, and for all the work that they did in developing this platform. I'm sure I've missed out a huge amount of stuff, but hopefully that gives you an overview of how important public libraries were to us and the development of this this access side of the, of the program. I just want to finish off to say that we did launch the platform nationally in March 2023. So you can see on the map currently, the initial take up has been fantastic. BFI replays live across 85 different library services across the UK, which equates to about 1,760 branch libraries. Um, 
this isn't the end. We've got new material that will continue to be added to the platform because the project is still running until December. Um, further resources are going to be supplied to libraries, which includes toolkits and activity packs, ways that we can get people to engage with their screen heritage in their local library. Um, and I just, I sort of wanted to conclude to say that, you know, you've heard from all our colleagues here tonight that Heritage 2022 project has required a massive amount of collaboration between the BFI departments and the organisations and partners we've worked with, and no small amount of innovation to do all that we said we would do within the time frame and resources we had to do it in. It's been a six year project that's seen three babies born to members of the team and has also seen the birth of BFI Replay, perhaps the most important baby of all, um, a streaming platform for our nation's screen heritage designed especially for public libraries. Thank you. Um, I just um, wanted to, to add to, to all of this is, uh, I think Katie just said at the end, although Heritage 22 as a lottery funded programme is coming to its end, uh, obviously BFI replay and the digitisation of materials and the ongoing curation and um, investigation, I suppose, of those digitised um, collections will continue um, in business as usual at BFI. Um, and BFI replay is, this is its first iteration. Um, I just, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's been an interesting journey for us and I think for all of us because we, we've worked in a different way around this one. It is, has it been about iterating the projects as we've gone and working with our partners? And the, it is in its infancy. This is just the beginning. But there are resource challenges around that. Um, and like, for example, we can only get 500 titles per month um, up on the, on the platform because of resource and capacity. Um, so, but it is in its infancy. And I'd encourage you all to go along to, to your UK Public Library and, and go and have a look at it. And if they haven't got it, ask them why and tell them to sign up. <laughs> um, so, was there any questions for our, uh, for our panel? I would say, as Nikki pointed out at the start, the, the project was born purely for public libraries. That was um, the Esme Fairburn Foundation, one of our funders for the project. They were really keen to um, for us to develop something with libraries in mind because they see it as the last civic space where people can go um, for free. Um, so that's why the project was developed for public libraries. I know Nikki sort of discussed how this mm. is the first iteration of BFI Replay, but it's worth noting we've not really covered it in today's today's talk, but um, rights is obviously, you know, something that the BFI has to clear in order to make anything available, and it's been a huge and rigorous process to rights clear for public libraries, so I just wanted to shout out our rights team yeah. for all the amazing hard work they've done. Yeah. Well. We're at about 11,000 rights cleared at the moment for BFI Replay, and yeah, it's, it's um, as you can you, you will know, it's complex in terms of the rights holders, donors. Um, funnily enough, also, it was really um, central to DCMS, um, that they wanted us to focus on the library, a library product. As, um, but what we've done this time, which is different to, to things that have happened in the past, like media techs, everyone will know what you'll, you'll know as BFI um, members about the media techs, and we've got one downstairs. But what we wanted to do was to create something that could be sort of built up and pulled apart as well in different iterations. So um, it's been built in a way from the back end that we can pull it apart and we could take titles off that we didn't have rights and clearances for in libraries because it's a walled garden. It gives more protection to those titles and our, and our partners. Um, we could pull it apart, which is what we're looking at now. We could pull it apart and create another version of it, which would be um, which, which could sit outside of libraries, which would have a different set of content on. Um, we at the BFI, uh, we obviously have a, an approach to risk, one approach to risk in terms of titles and our partners, the archive partners, have different approaches to risk as well in terms of, and it's an ongoing discussion, isn't it, about IP and copyright and protection of, of the work, um, which our, our partners, you know, um, share with us. And so we're trying to manage that all the time as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but we do intend for this not to be the only place that it will be, but it is the beginning. Absolutely, yeah, always. Um, I mean, uh, I've worked on many projects now, um, 
with with online access to, to public material to, to, to uh, public access to video material um, 20, 20 odd years now and it, it writes is an absolutely massive part of it and, and you know and, and often soul destroying because you've 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 built something around the idea of having a particular kind of content and you can't always get it um, and it's for you know many reasons. Um, sometimes it's simply not possible to identify who owns it, um, mm. even. So that's a big part mm. of right. You know, rights research is a massive undertaking in itself. Negotiation mm. is the last part of, of the thing. We don't have any of our rights colleagues with us to, to go through the process. But yes, it's 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 and and we spend a lot of time with our rights colleagues in pro projects like this. You know, identifying priorities because sometimes these things take ages. Yeah. Um, just getting somebody to pick up the phone, you know. Um, you know, I mean, and we're talking about organisations that don't necessarily, you know, expect to be having these conversations. You know, um, local authorities, you know, charities, um, uh, and so on. So, you know, getting somebody who feels able to make a decision can be very hard. It's not always a sort of lack of interest or will. So, yes, absolutely. And we constantly make compromises, and we constantly hit mm. dead ends. Yes. And also, there's well, a back. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add to that. One of the, I feel slightly privileged actually, because one of the things that my team were able to do was to uh, kind of operate because we were kind of the objective that we were working to was around the preservation question. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, outside of that rights issue, uh, we were able to kind of think about those those titles that we could. Um, do the preservation work on thinking about those those things that were surfacing to the top as as kind of uh, culturally significant, mm. um, and not maybe be so hamstrung by the rights question that some of my colleagues were when they were, they were thinking about the public access offer. Yeah, and we, and we have like in some cases, so for example, like ITV or Channel Four, and um, we've had <laughs> lengthy discussions, haven't we, Mark, with ITV around and negotiations around what we can have, what's their jewels, you know crown jewels that we can't touch but also I suppose that negotiation of like because there's a commercial aspect for them as well but um, you know there's ways through it but we can't we've got jewel in the crown we've got, we've got jewel in the crown. crown jewels we've got jewel in the crown yeah um. <laughs> yeah we've got jewel in the crown <laughs> so yeah it is um but we've got three people in our rights team plus a manager who've been working on this for the last four years um and they're up to i think in total we've got about um 20 000 rights cleared and about 10 11 000 for that for replay so we, we will continue as we can within our resource uh, to keep putting stuff on but that probably our approach post december will be more much more strategic in terms of the con of what we ingest won't it mark there are also some, some <laughs> things that we have permission to use which we will choose not to yeah <laughs> um so so not all of it, it's not yeah. always a perfect match yeah Perhaps, yeah. I mean, it it does outnumber. Um, it, it usually does in in terms of the BFI's collections. Nonfiction is is significantly larger than fiction. Um, not as much larger, I think, as, as television is to film. But uh, I don't have the figures on hand. Um, so yes, it is quite heavily weighted towards nonfiction. The uh, the regional national archives collections as well are are even more typically heavily weighted towards nonfiction. So yes, I mean, so. It's interesting. The story, the, the 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 stories that we did end up coming back to are often social history stories, yeah. um, which isn't always the stories that the BFI tells in other contexts, um, like in the cinemas. But um, you know, there, there there absolutely is fiction in there, um, and and quite a bit of television fiction in particular. But yeah, bits and pieces of other things as well. I mean, you know, quirky things too. You know, amateur amateur video fiction can be. <laughs> A thing <laughs> it can be entertaining in its own ways. Um, yeah, I particularly like the public service films because that takes There's me right back to some really interesting <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, what I would say to that is that the, the um, th this project is very much focused on. Uh, selection of, of the 100,000. What that did not mean, of course, was that, um, you know, the, 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 the stuff that's, that's fallen out of that is not stuff that we would still like to continue to do. Um, you know, if, if with kind of 
uh, any future projects and pockets of money and stuff. So there was it was not um, it's something that, that, that we were trying to focus on in terms of the the, the greatest need in this particular moment, um, and that was what was kind of driving us uh, there. That was kind of factoring into it, but it was not. Um, Exclusive in the sense that you know, if it didn't make the one hundred thousand, then that's it forever. You know, and the hope is is that you know other opportunities will come along to kind of think about you know our, our, our other parts of the collection now as well. Is, is that what you were driving at? I mean, can I can I can I add to that? Because I mean, the the other thing, of course, the, the tragedy at the heart of the story of video is that is exactly that. Mm, that mm. So much, it's you know, it's it's it survived so badly, um, mm. particularly for certain periods, and and, and many of us will be aware of the, the, the particular tragedy of sort of 1960s and 70s in television, um, which is really just leaves gaping holes in what I call the fossil record of, of, tele, of video. Um, and so, yes, that, that was, I mean, it couldn't really be at the heart of the project because the project is about preserving what we have, but it does make it more imperative, mm. preserving what we still have. Mm. And, and of course, there is probably, though less and less, bits of video out there mm. unpreserved, and that's kind of, uh, that does gnaw away a little bit. Um, thinking of the independent production sector in particular, you know, where where is this stuff? Is it is it yeah. is there still time? Yeah, I mean, I just had one of the curators, the te our television curator Lisa Kerrigan, contact me this week and say, we've just been offered the TVAM um, collection, and it's sat in Associated Press in their offices, just sat piled up. Uh, but you know, it's like we need the resource and we need the money to bring it in to accession it for my co esteemed colleagues to do all that work around it. Um, but this, you know, this is kind of what happens. It's just sat, and I've, I'm guilty too. I've got stuff in my attic, not <laughs> not looked after or preserved. Um, but I suppose the magic as well is that I think is that also that thing about when you put a tape in, you don't know actually what's going to be on it or what's not going to be on it. And that was the thing that um, everyone had to work with because you didn't act. And there's a lot of times with Andy would ring me up and say, oh, actually the barcode on this tape, Nikki, isn't matching what it said it was. Um, but you had gems that we discovered too, didn't you? Yeah, we? absolutely. I mean, there's occasions where we'd have um, essentially content which is missing believed wiped category content um, that we weren't expecting on the tape where kind of the same situation as what you were talking about is where the tape in a previous life was used to record footage and then was recorded over. But this footage has been captured at the very end of the tape. Um, so there has been instances of that kind of footage turning up. Um, but similarly, we've had tapes turn up that are blank. So, you know, we've got a list of content that's supposed to be on it, but it's a blank tape. Yeah. Thankfully, that is a very small percentage, but um, unfortunately, it does happen because, um, you know, as Mark's touched on, we haven't necessarily looked at all of the content. People haven't looked at these videotapes. They've been submitted, um, put in archives, and until they're digitised, we don't necessarily know what's on them. Yeah. And, and even our own exceptions, we found a, a, some, a clip of, was it our peak, yeah, peak from our exceptions uh, team found some footage of yes yeah, so this um so peter young who's one of our archive tech uh, technology um, um experts who processes a lot of the problematic tapes found a news item from 1988 about an raf tornado world tour um that was taking place um which was the raf going around in these tornadoes doing air shows and joint exercises with various um countries around the world um, but Pete actually took part in this um, exercise. He was um, part of the film crew and he worked for British Aerospace at the time before the BFI. And um, he was taking part in doing filming promotional material of these planes um, and came across this footage um, of the central TV regional news item, which he didn't know existed. So um, it was a really interesting find and it was a, you know, a happy memory for Pete because he suddenly found this footage and it's one tape, like one 10 second clip on a news item tape out of 80,000 tapes that he happened to come across. Um, and it kind of shows the power of um, replay as well and unlocking this this footage for people to see and discover these these things. So, mm. yeah, really interesting find. It's um, yeah. a bit of a one in a hundred thousand. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely, it's a really good point. So um, it was actually one of the biggest challenges of the project is actually the data size and transfer itself. Um, so one digitized file could be anywhere between sort of one gigabyte and over 100 gigabytes, depending on the length of the tape. Um, if you think that that's one file and scaling up to 100,000 titles, that's a huge amount of data that we're getting from you know, several different suppliers across the UK and Europe. 
Um, so that was one of the big challenges, getting the sheer size and quantity of data through to the BFI, which caused a number of issues to do with bandwidth, because um, it's a very limited pipeline that you could transfer these, these files. Um, so we often had backlogs with the suppliers transferring them. And then we would similarly have issues with backlogs of ingesting the files into our digital preservation infrastructure. So this is where we preserve the files for longevity, essentially. Um, it's preserved, the DPI is essentially like a, a data tape library. And there's uh, three different libraries, someone confirm, um, in different areas um, within the conservation centre and one off-site. So that's, um, it, it's, not, it's only accessible internally. So um, the suppliers who supply the files supply them to um, like a, an external folder, and then we have access to that folder. Um, but there's no, there's various, you know, firewall and safety protocols to stop people accessing our data library. Um, it's very limited the number of people who can access that library and that data. Um, so there's a lot of security considerations, um, and there's copies of those data in the different mm -hmm. data libraries as well. Um, so obviously that's part of that um, long-term security risk as well mm. and preservation. But it security. is a lot of data, a lot of energy, a lot of it's resource. A huge amount of data. <laughs> Did you yeah. want to add anything to that, Dylan? Uh, no, other than to no. say, um, you know, it is a it is a kind of um, international kind of uh, preservation practice to have kind of three copies of, of, of these materials in, in se you know, separate locations as well so that there's, mm. there's no kind of risk to that as well and also to point out as well that um, this was a digitization project uh, what it wasn't was um, anything to do particularly with um, looking at the video tape material and, and and storage and all that kind of stuff so you know yes we have the the, the digits but we are also retaining uh, the videotapes that have been digitized too yeah we haven't got rid of anything no. yet <laughs> but we haven't got rid of anything. um and um i think it's like dylan was saying earlier about the ones and zeros you still got to keep that moving as well to keep it um preserved and i can guarantee i can assure you i've signed a lot of off a lot of po's for data storage tapes and bits of technology that i don't understand that Stephen mcconaughey keeps asking to buy to keep building our data storage so yeah but it's not it's not without its challenges for sure is there anything else no, thank you very much i think we are at time thank you joel um thank you very much for joining us i hope you've enjoyed this evening um really enjoyed your questions it's been great <laughs> Um, so thank you very much, um, and yeah, well, um, we are uh, moving on across yeah, the country with, with the replay rollout, so um, love your feedback on that. Uh, if you manage to get to a local library and have a look at it, um, please give us your feedback on what you think. Thank you. <laughs>